Well, thanks, Scott, and, and Kat for organizing this amazing day. Um, it's really uh, nice to come back to San Diego. And um, um, so, uh, and this is the building I left yesterday. I'll show you what it looks like. Uh, and to come here is really a great pleasure, um, my disclosures. Um, but this is where I left, um, a foot of snow on Wednesday. And um, this is one mile from my house, and I'm the only house on the street that has any electrical power, and that's because we have a generator. <laughs> and uh, so who would have thought in March that they'd be doing this? Um, and uh, so it's very nice to come out to this weather. My wife, unfortunately, is going to cost me a lot of uh, bonus points in the past or to pay back. So, okay, cancer. Um, the tumor microenvironment is, you know, you heard an extraordinarily, I think, sophisticated view of what that is from Jeremy. And it makes you wonder if you can ever cure any cancer when you see what Jeremy just showed us. It's, it's really depressing. Um, so from an immunotherapist point of view, this is what I'm talking about, step six. This is the most famous slide in cancer immunology right now, which is from Ira Melman. And it talks about the steps of things we need to do to try to change the balance between the immune system and, and, and the tumor out competing it. But one way is to add in more effector T cells, and we can do that with T cell receptor modified cells or CAR T cells. Um, so CAR cells are now, I think everyone understands, are a chimeric cell that has an antibody as a recognition motif rather than the T cell receptor, which sees peptide and MHC. Um, and there's much work going on in, in designing increasingly sophisticated CARs. The ones that are now FDA approved have either CD28 as a signaling domain, that's what Kite has, or FormBB, which is the Novartis version. Um, so there's a lot of work there. I'm not going to go over that today. Um, we've recently uh, published that ICOS, for instance, can change cell CAR T cell fate from a TH1 cell into, say, a T follicular cell or TH17. Um, so the signaling domain can both regulate the T cell proliferation, but also how the cell differentiates. Um, and we showed uh, several years ago that the signaling domain can also reprogram uh, the metabolic state of the cell. For, so basically to use either uh, glucose um, in cytosolic metabolism or to use uh, um, uh, fatty acid oxidation in mitochondria. So you can actually turn on mitochondrial biogenesis by expressing the 4 and BB signaling domain, which activates TRAF2 and other downstream pathways. So um, we began using this, and in, in the, uh, the Kimriah, or, or this name, the USAN name is Tisagen Lecluzel, from, uh, that was made in my lab that now Novartis has called it that. Um, but we get, began treating patients with CLL in 2010. So we have uh, almost eight years of follow-up in those patients. And then we've treated basically all other B cell malignancies now in a, in a series of paper, uh, papers. Um, and, um, but the drug in, the, in this case is all autologous T cells using a 10-day manufacturing process with a lenival vector to introduce the car. And then um, the cells are harvested and frozen in infusion-ready DMSO after 10 days. And then they're just given to the patient via, um, you know, there's a 37-degree water bath in the patient's room, just like a stem cell transplant. The cells are thawed and infused um, over five minutes. Um, and you know, it was FDA approved in August, which was a big deal for us um, back then um, in, in August. And um, we've now looked at, in this unpublished work, um, at our first two patients we ever treated. They were reported in the New England Journal in 2011. So we have follow-up now, and this goes out seven years. Um, and um, in red is the car as far as uh, measured by a quantitative PCR assay. So there was you know, a very sharp peak here. This was 10 days after we treated the patient, and it's collapsed down onto the axis because it's out to seven years. And the same thing on, on the second patient. So the, the cars have persisted for seven years in both patients, um, but they've gone down by about three orders of magnitude from their original level. So um, we can see them by fax um, in both blood and bone marrow, so we can stay in the anti-idiotype. And so it's a true living drug that's now, list, you know, the patient's got treated one time, and it's lasted seven years in these patients who had CLL. Now, what the, this blue line shows is the B cells in the patient, and they have a very deep B cell aplasia. Um, so we can't find any B cells. In fact, all the IGH gene is germline in these patients. So they have no mature B cells. 
and, and by a very sensitive assay for this uh, the malignant clone, they don't have that either. Um, so they're in complete remission um, and uh, um, with a single infusion. That's CLL. Um, and um, the, um, we've now looked at what predicts response or not, both in CLL and ALL. And, and um, um, by taking patients who had, in our initial CR, CLL trial, that we had an overall response rate of 57%. Some CR patients, some had PR and some non-responding. And by transcriptomics, there's a big difference. This is the apheresis product used to manufacture the car cell. So you can predict who will respond or not by their cells that come out of their arm. And, and the CR patients have these by, uh, and you can see by principal component analysis, the CRs are different from the non-responding patients. And the, uh, the, the CR patients have uh, good stuff. They have, um, you know, metabolically effector T cells. The non-responding patients have the hallmarks of exhausted T cells, um, which you can also see in patients who have chronic high viral loads like hepatitis C or HIV that's untreated. So, so, so you can predict who will respond or not. And a major question now is can we fix these non-responding patients and make them so that they um, would be effective that, and they can proliferate in the patient and eradicate the tumor. If, if we can't, then I think it becomes a regenerative medicine issue of you know, either using unrelated donors or um, IPSCs, et cetera. So um, that's in CLL. Um, we don't see this in ALL because 90% of the patients respond. Their T cells work. CLL, and you know, Tom Kipps has been a leader and it shuts off. CLL turns off the immune system in many different ways. Um, okay, so we've all also taken the, the CAR T cells from these patients and after they were manufactured, we had some that were saved and we could put them into a CLL model using the, a tumor line that John Bird's made called OSU-1. And um, when we do that, uh, the uh, CAR T cells from um, the patients who did not go into remission don't, they, they, there's untreated mouse, that's from a, a non-responding patient. And then responding patients cure the mice and same as a healthy donor T cell. Um, so the CAR T cells mimic what they do in this NSG orthotopic model what, what they've done in the patients. Um, and what is the correlation is, is the ability of the cells to proliferate. And we've seen that in all our trials that the proliferation of the CAR T cells is uh, associated with responses. Um, so this just sums that up. The, what, um, what we found is the effector T cells look like good Th1 cells. They have, interestingly, an IL-6 STAT3 signaling signature, they have the IL-6 receptor on the T cells, or CD8 cells, or CD27, 28 positive cells, and, um, um, and, and that's what pre predicts responses in, in uh, CLL patients. Um, so we've down in ALL, so in CLL there are very rare times when patients relapse. They've been very durable responses. In ALL there's a 28% uh, relapse rate that we've seen in uh, ALL, and uh, there are now three mechanisms that we've seen. One is escape by target loss, which um, really says that the way the cars work are by targeting CD19, so the car T's, the, the ALL can lose either through splicing changes, the CD19 protein. Um, we've seen, as I mentioned, exhaustion or activation-induced cell death of the T cells. That's much more in lymphoma and in CLL than ALL. And we now have this, what, what we've seen called CARB, which are the CAR expressed in the B cell. And it's a really ex um, interesting uh, uh, study um, and, and uh, finding. And this is work from Marco Orella and my group. So um, we had a patient who was report, reported as a CR in our New England Journal paper, treated with the C19 CAR. The patient was 22 years old, had ALL. Um, and this is, um, the CAR TLs went up and down and then um, in the patient with the usual kinetic we see. But at nine months, he began to have CAR, this is uh, looking at the CAR by the 4MBB signaling domain, which no, normally isn't in the normal human genome. So he had a recrudescence of the CAR at nine months, but yet by staining with anti-idiot type, he did not. And uh, when we looked at his recurrent leukemia, um, you know, there are CD45 uh, DIM, like you see with ALL, positive, and, um, CD22 positive, 
And this is staining with a car using an anti-idiotype. All of his relapsed leukemia cells had a car in them. A really striking finding. We expected to see the car in his T cells, but they were in the B cells, in his blasts. And um, we then did lenivar uh, vector. We isolated these car cells, the leukemic blasts, which were C19 negative, 22 positive. And we found two integrations of the car in his uh, recurrent leukemia. One was in um, this uh, propionyl uh, carboxylase gene, which um, is a mitochondrial enzyme that uh, metabolizes fatty acids. And um, the car was, is in reverse orientation, and it's uh, um, in, intronic uh, in, in this gene on exon. Uh, in, and uh, exon, between exons 18 and 19. Uh, and the other integration of the car was uh, in neuropillin 1, just downstream of neuropillin 1, which is a ligand for VEGF. Um, and we can't find that it's changing the function of neuropillin 1 or PCCA, the carboxylase gene. So we think they're passenger integrations at this point. Um, and um, this is staining baseline with confocal microscopy baseline, and it relapse. Um, so baseline, his tumor was CD19 positive. The surface of the tumor stained CD19 negative at relapse. But uh, by confocal, we can see CD19. And it's um, basically masked with a car. So this is how the tumor cell escaped. It had the car integrated in, and then that trapped CD19. Then the CAR T cells were unable to kill this target. And um, so this is the masking model, and we've shown this now. Also works with CD22. If we put a CD22 car in, it converts the leukemic blast to CD22 negative, as far as all the antibodies we stain. And um, so, so that's one patient. We've looked retrospectively at 18 cases, and seven out of 18 we found uh, CAR B cells in the infused product, yet there's no change in the relapse rate in those patients. Um, so we've had. This is the only patient to relapse, but the fundamental observation here is I think it's one of the first, I mean, it really proves the cancer stem cell hypothesis. One cell is what killed this patient. He died nine months or 18 months after he relapsed, and all of those cells had the car in, and they all have, we've done single cell analysis, they all have the same integrations of uh, the car, and um, they have the same IGH rearrangement as this parental tumor. So one cell that was in vitro transduced inadvertently with a car um, as what then they converted the cell from, we assume initially it was C19 positive on the surface, and then the car trapped it, made it a T cell escape. Um, so what that points to is we need, you know, more and more sophisticated T, uh, manufacturing to get higher and higher tumor um, uh, 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 purging. So this is in all the bone marrow transplant areas, tumor contamination has never been shown to cause relapse. It's always been the tumor in the patient. Here, the car eradicated all the tumor in the patient, and it was a carryover of one cell that ended up, uh, unfortunately, causing his demise. OK, back to CLL. Um, so these are the first, I told, showed you the seven-year follow-up of these first two patients. Um, and I'm going to talk to you now about this patient here, who I've mentioned here, and we have now more data about, um, who had um, also a complete remission. and. Um, so this man had um, well, the 10th patient we treated with CLL, and he had a, a late, a delayed onset of tumor lysis syndrome. When we first treated him, he had a very early cytokine release syndrome, and we treated him with steroids and anti-L6, and nothing happened. He continued to have circulating blasts. Um, and then we treated him again, and he had, then this time, a massive expansion of the CAR T cells, cytokine release syndrome that was delayed. This is interferon gamma, IL-6. So the first time, nothing happened, really. Uh, it was blunted, we think, by the anti-L6 early in the steroids. And then these are his leukemic blasts. They cleared away, and he's in a, a very deep CR now, four years later. He had a lot of, he had also you know, masses both abdominally and uh, mediastinal that have all cleared up. Um, and when we looked at him then, why did he have this delayed response? Um, initially, he had, when we sorted his, his car cells, they were polyclonal. There was, um, um, in all different V beta families. So the cars are in both CD4 cells and CD8 cells. But at the time of tumor lysis, they were all CD8 cells um, and one T cell receptor that's V beta 5.1 positive. And um, that shows here staining, the staining again with anti-car idiotype. 
at, at this time point here when you had tumor lysis, uh, they're all uh, one TCR. Um, and um, uh, by integration site analysis, at uh, baseline, I mean, he had over a thousand different integrations that we could identify in his infused car product. But at the time of tumor lysis syndrome, there, there's only one integration event, and it's into the gene TET2, which is what this heat map shows. And so I've talked about this some in the past, and we now have more information about it. Um, so we had one copy of the car in his car that um, T cells had proliferated extensively, you know, uh, at the time of tumor lysis syndrome. And it created um, uh, three, we found three chimeric splice variants that all made premature stop codons for uh, TET2. And, um, and the, the car was integrated intronically um, between exons, uh, in, uh, exons 9 and 10, and then that uh, created the stop, premature stop codon, which then knocks out TET2's enzymatic function. And we've, we've proven that by uh, reconstructing this, so the dioxinase doesn't work anymore. Um, so in T cells, there are three TET genes, TET1, 2, and 3. Um, TET mutations do occur in hemologic malignancies. They're not sufficient for oncogenesis, but they can. Um, they're the first gene mutated often in AML and, um, um, and in certain T cell uh, leukemias and lymphomas in, in particular. And they're loss of function mutations uh, that can lead, uh, lead to clonal metapoiesis. Um, so, um, you know, what we, we found in this patient was that he had this clonal uh, outgrowth of CAR T cells. It was a CD8 cell. Um, and, um, and four years later, so he came back um, four years later to get rebled, and he still has these cells, but they're no longer dominant. They're about 0.1% of all of his CD8 cells are the CAR T cells, and he has a, a B cell aplasia and, and no leukemia that we can identify. We've done ATAC seq on the patients cells, and we compared, uh, these are two other patients who got CRs, the ones I showed the long-term follow-up, and their T cells at the time of peak tumor lysis syndrome, when 80 or 90 percent of the circulating cells are CAR cells, they look like effector memory cells, so that's, um, but this patient, they look like stem cells. The patient, they had the step TET2 knockout, um, and by GO analysis, we see things that you see in stem cells. And by looking for transcription factor motifs or lost or gained in, in uh, the patients. So we sorted his, his CAR positive cells, compared them to his T cells that are CAR negative. So we have a really nice internal control. And he gains these transcription factors um, and loses BOC2. And BOC2 is the gene that leads to differentiation of T cells and has been found to be a master factor that way. Um, and then interestingly, by ATAC-seq, his interferon gamma locus is is closed down in the CAR cells compared to the CAR negative cells. And um, so the more differentiated T cells get, the more interferon gamma they make. His cells are restrained in their differentiation. Um, and they look like stem central memory cells by immunologic uh, flow analysis. So what happens in healthy donor T cells? If you knock down TET2 with an SHRNA by, by 50%, we initially for a year didn't see any effects. Um, but then um, Joe Friata did the right experiment was he stimulated with CD19 leukemia cells, healthy donor cells where they have knocked down or scrambled TET2 RNA, and we had to use control cars also that had mesothelin uh, as a recognition motif instead of CD19. So there's antigen dependent, meaning through CD19. Did, um, initially, the proliferation rate's the same, uh, but then the cells start taking off. They divide more when they see their target. So it's antigen dependent meaning through the surrogate antigen, they proliferate more, they stay less differentiated. Um, and, um, um, and so what we've learned from this is, um, you know, that the progeny from one single T cell, if it can proliferate a lot, is enough to eradicate leukemia. Uh, it's really a stunning observation um, and in, in this patient. Um, and our other patients that have spent polyclonal CAR T cell expansion, we find many different integrated events, but in this patient, it's one. And, um, and so we, we wonder now if, if a low dose could actually make CAR T cell therapy much cheaper if, if we only had to use uh, one, one or a few cells, um, if we can replicate this. And it's safe. There's a lot of issues to still figure out. Um, okay, what about solid tumors? Because um, there's no one's really had any home runs with solid tumors, unlike um, the... Uh, um, you know, leukemia, B cell and myeloid, uh, bone marrow-derived tumors. Um, uh, 
So uh, there are a number of you know, ways where T cell receptors might, may well work for solid tumors. Um, Steve Schoenberger has a lot of data about that from here. Neoantigens from tumor-specific mutations or shared antigens such as cancer testis antigens may well work, and there's data from Adaptimmune where they have a registration trial for synovial cell sarcoma with uh, T cell receptor transduced T cells. CAR targets, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about now. In uh, glioblastoma, there's, there, we've done a trial with EGFR to a splice variant 3, and then glycans, and this has worked from Avery Posey in my group. Um, so EGFR, splice variant 3, has been well studied in glioblastoma. It's about 35% of the tumors. It's a, because it's only in the tumor, it's a t target that you know, it's not, not on normal tissues, unlike many of the other targets we have for solid tumors. Um, the, the real advantage of C19 for CARs and B-cell tumors is people that are born without C19 are healthy. They just need antibody replacement. So we don't have that um, luxury in the solid tumors. And then it's known, you know, from work like, um, you know, Paul Michel here that the EGFRV3 is subclonal. It's not in the founding um, mutations. So um, we would expect to need other targets in addition to EGFRV3. Um, so with Novartis, we made, uh, we began with an antibody, a murine hybridoma against uh, V3, um, and uh, made a humanized version um, that has these um, uh, B a core binding to either wild type uh, EGFR or to the um, to uh, um, the splice variant. And then we made a car that's uh, identical to the CD19 car, except it's the, sp the single chain FV is against V3 and not CD19. Um, and we tested then, the real issue is um, one, one with this antibody, would it bind to normal wild type EGFR? So a car pro against wild type EGFR would likely be lethal. It would cause uh, very severe colitis and uh, you know, skin rash. And uh, so we made mice with um, human foreskin graft, grafted onto NSG mice and treated with either a car against wild type, cetuximab, EGFR, uh, and, or to the splice variant. And this is staining for CD3, and uh, the, um, you know, the grafts stay on these, these mice are empty, and given here, with cetuximab car, it kills the, the skin graft, and the EGFR V3 did not bind. So um, that let us start a clinical trial which we did with Novartis on, um, and Donna Rourke, a neurosurgeon at Penn, has done this on multifocal uh, glioblastoma patients with multiple relapses, a single infusion of the car, and we had 10 patients to study. Of the 10 patients, they all got a dose of 5 times 10 to the 8th car cells of these EGFR-specific cells, and some of the patients had no uh, surgery after infusion, but three or four had surgery a week or two after the infusion of the cars, and we've learned a lot from those patients. Um, one, which is that there's trafficking of the car T cells to the resected brain tissue in a subset of the patients. So this is the ratio of the car to the, in the blood pool compared to the brain biopsy, and, and these two patients had significant enrichment, so probably antigen-induced trafficking. And we also had loss of target in some of the patients. So this is reads for the splice variant of EGFR-V3 compared to the uh, EGFR wild type. And in um, most of the patients that went down in the biopsy specimen compared to their baseline. So there's evidence that it can hit that target. Um, and it didn't do that to EGFR full length wild type. Um, the bad news is here and on the next slide, which is there's an amazing adaptive resistance. So this is the baseline was a cold tumor in this patient, no T cells. And afterwards, there's a lot of T cells that we see by staining here um, for CD8, but also CD25. And um, there's the hypofunctioning T cells. There's not much granzyme expressed. And um, there are a lot of Tregs, this FOXP3 here, and, um, uh, and other immunosuppressive molecules like IDO and PDL1 is screamingly induced. So there's many different checkpoint molecules and metabolic defenses that the tumor um, displays after the CAR treatment. So um, I think that's depressing, <laughs> and it means it's, we're going to need complicated therapies, I think, for sure, in this tumor. It's not like a B-cell tumor. Um, so um, infusion of the cells was safe. Uh, we, we had one seizure in one patient, but, uh, and, um, uh, and uh, we saw some on-target activity and uh, loss then of the antigen, but the tumor remains without EGFRV3. 
Okay, so um, another potential target is glycans in, in, um, in solid tumors. And we've been looking at the uh, serine threonine linked glycans um, that um, are normally uh, uh, lengthened with a chaperone called Cosmic, an X linked gene that um, uh, lengthens uh, the, to full length uh, uh, um, gly, uh, glycosylation. But in the absence of Cosmic, um, the what happens is a short uh, hypoglycosylation has occurred, and there is called the STN if it has a salic acid terminal. Um, and when you stain a variety of tumors, um, you, um, you can find that this is the full length glycosylation, um, and this is human skin. For instance, there's a lot of that, and there's none of the TN or the STN antigen. But um, and if you knock out in with and make isogenetic cells. With, with uh, um, in this case, a tailin to knock out uh, cosmic, then you induce this, this short glycan and, and you lose the fully glycosylated glycan. That makes the cells more invasive, and this is a very nice study showing that, that this hypoglycosylation is associated with uh, a, a increased tumorigenicity. Um, so the idea is, like in the case of MUC1, which is expressed on many tumors, uh, that there's fully glycosylated in a healthy state, but in the tumor state, they're hypoglycosylated, and that potentially could be targeted. And we got an antibody for, in a collaboration with Henry Clausen in, in Copenhagen that targets specifically the TN antigen and, and ignores this antigens. And um, this just shows staining with that on, on tumor microarrays. Many tumors overexpress the TN antigen. So it's, it's a universal-like target. Um, and um, this is work that Avery did with confocal microscopy, looking at normal human kidney or uh, stained with MUC1 and EPCAN or um, with um, a breast tumor. And um, what, what he finds is in the human kidney there is um, MUC, the, the TN antigen is expressed, but it's all in the Golgi. And MUC1 is on the surface. And when you look at breast cancer, it's on the surface. So the only tissue we've seen the TN antigen expressed on is in, on the surface is on cancer cells. And, and this, this shows some of that. Um, so uh, this is the antibody then, it's called 5E5, and um, it makes CAR T cells, uh, if you put that in and express, they only respond to the full length, I mean to the hypoglycosylated antigen, and they ignore tissues that have um, are healthy uh, tissues, they don't kill them, but they kill cells that have the TN antigen. And it turns out the jerk at T-cell leukemia line that we use has a mutation that creates a truncation in cosmic, and so jerk at expresses this TN antigen, and Avery then uh, made a, tested that as a leukemic cell line in mice, NSU mice, and it, by IVIS you can see that it's very effective, whereas jerk at kills the mice here if they get um, untransduced T cells, um, but the CAR T cells with the 5E5 cures them. And, um, and most excitingly, this is a pancreatic cancer xenograft. When we give the CAR T cell, um, this is uh, to an intraperitoneal uh, can pancreatic cancer, the uh, mice by IVIS have a very strong response um, so that it can treat both uh, liquid tumors as, as well as these solid tumors that we tried. Um, and this is uh, data that um, 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 with a transgenic mouse that has now a human MUC1 and the TN antigen or not, we have staying with an antibody or treating with a car that has against wild type uh, MUC1 or against the 5E5. This is kidney and what is supposed is that there's, there's glomeruli here that still function but here they've been destroyed if you make a car against a wild type MUC1. Um, so uh, last thing, two, two quick things is, um, um, one is what about prostate cancer? And this is a follow-up to what Christina showed. Um, and um, you heard a lot about PSMA. What she didn't tell you about also is that the TGF beta is overexpressed in many prostate cancers and it's, um, uh, it, it, it correlates inversely with prognosis. And TGF beta both is, you know, advantage for the tumor, but also is immunosuppressive on T cells. Um, 
So Chris Kloss in my lab made a PSMA car and a dominant negative receptor for a TGF beta. So the T cells themselves, the CAR T cells, no, no longer respond to TGF beta. They respond the same as far as killing prostate cancer cells that have PSMA um, when they have the dominant negative receptor. Um, and um, they, interestingly here, this experiment I think says a lot. What he did was make a radiated prostate cancer cells that have PSMA and add them repeatedly so that there's continuous antigen uh, to the prostate, to the CAR T cells. And this is the CAR T cell that has CD19 and there's no CD19 stimulation. The, CAR, the T cells just die. But here with PSMA, uh, CAR T cells, they proliferate for two weeks and then stop dividing even though they're seeing their antigen. And they divide longer uh, uh, and much more uh, with, uh, if they have the dominant negative TGF beta receptor. And um, so we looked at what happened there. There's a lot of differentially expressed genes by 21 days uh, in this experiment um, by uh, uh, microarray analysis. And um, when you look at keg analysis, the difference between the wild type car cells and when they're chronically exposed to antigen and the ones that have TGF beta is things we'd like to see. Like, you know, you see the same uh, keg stuff that you've seen in inflammatory bowel disease, allograft rejection, and so on. And um, by network analysis, protein net interaction network analysis, day 14 and day 21, the main difference on day 14 is cytokines. There's both Th1 and Th2 cytokines made by these cells. And on day 21, there, the cytokine differences compared to wild type CAR, as well as um, a lot of transcription factors uh, and cell cycle genes. Um, so this is now in a clinical trial at University of Pennsylvania with uh, Naomi Haas leading this study. And we've done three patients at this very low dose with no chemotherapy. And then um, we just now have, we had to wait a month after the three patients were treated to get DSMB. And now we can treat the second cohort. And then we're going to have a third cohort where they get uh, lymphodepleting chemotherapy and the CAR T cells. So the primary object is to determine if it's safe really to target PSM, PSMA with CAR T cells. Um, and um, so in the mice, we see en enhanced efficacy. These are the PK of the first three patients we've treated. And we see in two patients really good proliferation of the CAR T cells, even at this low dose, mm -hmm. and no toxicity, um, and no efficacy yet. Um, and uh, so um, we're hoping now when we go up in dose, we'll find out is it safe to, to target PSMA, and uh, does it have any anti-tumor effects. Um, and this is work now with uh, CRISPR-Cas9 that a graduate student in my lab, Sonia, is doing, where she's now making uh, CAR T cells that are resistant to checkpoints, in this case, uh, both PD-1 and CTLA-4. And um, so if she has guide RNAs against both of those, she has a, about 85% of the cells don't express PS, uh, these checkpoints, and it makes them work better. Um, and uh, so, uh, uh, that's an ongoing project. Yang Bing Zhou in our group has then made T cell receptor transduced cells or CAR cells knocked out with PD-1 and, and CTLA-4, but five genes at one time. It, it's quite amazing multiplexing what you can do in T cells. And these are T cells that have you know, PD-1, CTLA-4 knocked out, and then FAS. They don't undergo activation and do cell death if, if we have the T cells with FAS knocked out. So we think we can make cells that will be more um, resistant to the tumor microenvironment using gene editing. We're now the only group, as far as I know, in the U.S. that has a trial open with CRISPR-Cas9 technology. And it's this trial here called the NICE trial, sponsored by the Parker Foundation and Community. And, um, and it's at three centers, because uh, and just as opened uh, last month at the University of Pennsylvania. And it's a basket trial using three, multiplexing three genes, the T-cell receptor alpha chain, beta chain, and PD-1. And then um, we're inserting a T cell receptor against New York ESO1 with an HLA A2 restricted TCR. So the trial is a basket design with myeloma, melanoma, and synovial cell sarcoma. Um, and with these goals to make checkpoint resistant cells, uh, delete the endogenous TCR, um, should decrease the risk of autoimmunity, and then, and then it's a, you know, to look at the off-target effects of CRISPR-Cas9. And the trial design is similar to what we've done previously with the New York ESO1 T cell receptor, except so it's a single infusion of the cells, of CAR T cells, and then we're following with single cell analysis. We have uh, um, with Stanford and Will Greenlee, we're doing um, a single cell ATAC-seq, 
and we can uh, deconvolve which cells have the car in them and which have PD-1 knocked out, and it's a competitive repopulation experiment. So we give it a cells that are mixed, some of them wild type PD-1, some have PD-1 knockout, same thing with TCRs, and we can, should be able to deconvolute what happens in the patients. So to sum up, we're at this kind of, we're at this stage now. Um, as of last year, we're now, we have a new kid in the block, you know, for cancer therapies. You know, when I started medical school, it was chemotherapy and radiation and surgery, and now we have, you know, cytokines, vaccines, antibodies, checkpoints, and targeted agents. And I, you know, this is a really exciting time now, learning how to use all of these. And I think, unfortunately, in the solid tumors, it's going to take many combinations like this to actually make a, any um, impact. This is my uh, the car lab, and um, uh, people that have done the work that I've talked about. So thank you for your attention. Dr. Jung, I have a question. Um, I don't know what's the um, lifespan of the CAR T cells, um, but to my best knowledge, they are not immortal because of the introduction of the Shosai gene. But if they can survive for a year or over a year, is it possible to cause the lymphoma, or especially T lymphoma? If so, how can you solve this problem? Thank you. Yeah, so, I mean, we, what we found out is I mean, the car cells survive long term. Whether, you know, in true memory is a, in from an immunologic point of view, is it's a T cell that survives without any antigen. In the case of CD19, it's pretty specific, it's a special case, probably because the bone marrow continues to try to make CD19 B cells. So there's, it's like it's a self vaccination in a way, okay? So we don't know if any of the car cells are surviving antigen independent of CD19. Um, and, um, and, and so far in CAR T cells and solid trials, people have not seen long-term uh, survival. So, um, so there's probably going to be different issues that are tumor specific. Um, it's very hard to transform human T cells. It's not like a fibroblast where if you put in a few oncogenes, they transform. So no one has been able to transform T cells. It's very different than stem cells where, you know, it's happened in clinical trials and and um, myeloid leukemias occur. And it probably is related to why in, in, in hematology, you know, T-cell leukemias are rare. What you mostly see is where cats, it's AML, myelodysplastic syndromes. But, and, and then B-cell leukemias, almost, it's very rare to see T-cell leukemias. And when they are, it's oftentimes due to a viral infection. Um, but uh, so, so T cells have a resistance for some reason, and this, the safety factor probably with genetic modification is probably going to be very cell type specific. And, you know, I, I think it's, um, so suicide genes and so on will be used. Um, but even without, we've now, there's no, uh, at this point, there's more than 1,000 people have been given CAR T cells, and not a single patient's had transformation of the T cells. <laughs> So with using lentiviruses or retroviruses. So it's safer than giving chemotherapy. We know that. I mean, if you look at the survivors of breast and ovarian cancer who get taxanes and platinum, you know, they have a 5% incidence of AML and myelodysplastic syndrome. So um, it is a concern, but so far it has been less than, you know, the safety factor in T cells is, is quite, um, uh, you know, it's, it's well validated because we have, you know, the system where patients have to get followed up through the recombinant, you know, the RAC committee through FDA reports. Well, it's very impressive, um, particularly you. how quickly you're moving these agents into the clinic. Um, the, the question I had, you, when you uh, related to the glycan um, a story, um, and, and I don't know, you probably know this, um, maybe not, but there's... Uh, and I don't know how you could make a, t you know, a CAR T around it potentially, but there is a, a drug called Unitoxin, if you've heard of that. It was developed um, here, actually, um, Alice Yu, David Cherish. Um, and um, it's FDA approved in 2015, and it's very effective at pediatric uh, cancer. And they've done it with chemotherapy, and it works, and so on. And of course, it's a glycan. Um, so I, I don't know if that's something that you could um, integrate into the CAR T or something? I think, you know, that's, there, there are a lot of, you know, like Wendell Lim at UCSF has been making CAR T's with, 
you know, two different cars at one time and making them inducible. And I think that might be, it just depends on, you know, the expression level if it's, I mean, low level expression is not safe with CAR T cells. You know, you can, with antibodies, you can have and discriminate and have a wider therapeutic index, as you know. But with CAR T cells right now, as far as we can tell, there's no safety level. It's either present or absent. I can send you a few of the articles. Okay, yeah. And, and it may be a perfect one to have, you know, if it's expressed at low levels on normal. T so, for instance, we have, you know, we made, there was a, a paper from China showing that in glioblastoma, you know, in German, there is um, SSEA4 is expressed in a, many glioblastomas. Um, and so we got an antibody. We thought this would be a great, because all the literature says SSEA4 is not expressed in health in, in adults. So we made the car against SSE for this globoid, like, and it, it's the same in a mouse as it is in humans, so um, the structure of it. And we um, treated mice with a car against SSE A4, and they all fell over dead six days later. There's low-level expression in the lung that's never been reported. And we made knockout mice to actually prove it was on target effects. So um, you have to be very careful with new targets. Um, and. You know, that's, uh, you know, we had really awful experience with a T cell receptor that had off-target recognition in the heart. You know, of, of a, you know, it was New York ESO, I mean, it was May J3, but the receptor also hit, uh, you know, unexpectedly, uh, Titan, which is, you know, in the heart. <laughs> I think that's a great idea. I mean, it might, um, um, I mean, that's what we need is target. I mean, and for solid tumors, I don't think single targeting is going to work. I mean, especially after what you saw from Jeremy. I mean, it's, you know, um, going to be complex that way. Uh, Steve? Thanks, Carl. Um, great talk. And as always, a couple of quick questions. Do you think the experience with the, um, the CAR B cells? is crying for a solution through a suicide gene or better selection of the product? And secondly, can you model any of the adaptive uh, resistance that you're seeing in, a, in an animal so you can see if maybe inactivating uh, interferon gamma would shut down some of this uh, resistance? Yeah. So the, um, as far as the suicide genes, I think they, they're going to work maybe on some, to change the therapeutic index where there is some expression on normal cells. And so, and that, you know, Malcolm Brenner's and what David Spencer, they made, you know, the caspase 9 system, an inducible switch. And it works great for graft versus host disease. But a lot of studies have shown for graft versus host disease, you need to maybe knock out 90% of the T cells, and then it becomes subclinical. You don't have to get rid of all of them. For what we had here, I mean, it, you had to knock out every single cell. And I, you know, no one has made a suicide system that's, you know, you know gets 100%. And, um, um, you know, maybe total body radiation and a transplant would do that. So that's a big issue. Um, and so having controllable systems and so on is where the field's going to go instead of these constitutively expressed uh, uh, cars that we have right now. And then right now we have no good models for the toxicity, like, you know, cytokine release syndrome, neurotoxicity occurs with C19 cars for unknown reasons. Doesn't occur in the syngenetic mice so far. But I think that's, that needs to be done is to model those. And, um, you know, like for instance, knocking out interferon gamma signaling, or could we shut that off? Right, right now, we don't know. Yes. With, with uh, the CD19 cars, um, does the chronic depletion of B cells feed back in any way to affect the hematopoietic stem cells? So, like, do you see that they're undergoing increased proliferation or they're, you know, have shifted their fate to try to replace those? lymphocytes that are missing. So that's, um, you know, all these patients have had, you know, a lot of, dan you know, previous chemotherapy lines. So, I mean, they don't, that's, they don't start with a normal marrow compartment. And um, um, so in mice, uh, there are studies that if you um, knock out B cells, that you get more Th1 bias. Okay, and so you get actually better anti-tumor immunity. That's part of, I think, the rationale for Mike Karen's study, in addition to some other issues. And uh, um, 
So I think there's a theoretic risk that um, of autoimmunity might be enhanced when you knock out the B cells long term. The patients are getting, you know, uh, the pediatrics have, um, are getting gamma globulin replacement therapy. It, we have data now that the adults maintain their, you know, their plasma, long life plasma cells that are C19 negative. They, their antibody titers just stay right, not unchanged, you know, say against varicella or whatever. But in the kids, I mean, they don't have all, the, they haven't been um, vaccinated and so on, so they don't have memory antibody plasma cells. That, and so there, the immunodeficiency is more severe. And I think we're going to have CAR T cells where we shut these off, you know, and that's one of the things Calibers uh, uh, is uh, developing as a way to turn it on and off um, rather than the permanent, w which it is right now. Carl, uh, I'm go here. This way. This oh, way. got it. Okay. Yeah. Now, I'm going to ask you an old-fashioned question because you, you use language that is no longer in, in vogue, but uh, that triggers uh, curiosity. The, when you inject, uh, if you have a look at it, or you can predict what may happen, because those cells are specifically carrying a, a, a quite monomorphic molecules. Uh, what would be, and the T cell carrying a surface antigen are highly immunogenic. And uh, the immunogenicity in this case would be the idiotype of the antibody that is on the T cell. And the literature back in the 80s when we were in shorts says that the best way of inducing anti-idiotype, or one way of doing it, would be to cross-link immunoglobulin at the surface of T cell. So what is your experience, number one? Number yeah. two, what do you think is the, uh, the um, dynamic implication of uh, if this happens? So it's a really interesting issue. Um, and I mean, and we were completely wrong, I mean, and, and so are the textbooks. So we had in our consent form when we treated our first patient in 2010 that because we knew we had a, a murine hybridoma, you know, FMC63 was hybridome in is our CD19 car. And, and we said, and then there's a few coding joints between 4MBB and the Zeta chain. We said, you know, this will be rejected by your immune response in three or four weeks. And that's what we had in our consent form. We didn't think there would be long-term engraftment. And we thought we were going to have to have a human, a fully human car to have any chance of long-term persistence. And it turns out, you know, we, uh, I think it's an example, uh, you know, you get this deep B cell aplasia, the patients do not make HAMA, and, and so 75% of them have long-term, basically indefinite persistence of these, but, um, and it, we think that's because we're targeting CD19, because in our solid tumor trials, like um, if we, we've done mesothelium, we had a patient get anaphylaxis to a mouse antibody that Ira Paston made, it's a, so an anti-mesothelian car that's fully a mouse, and every patient, when we expressed it, rejected it within three or four weeks, both with HAMA and T-cell CTL responses. So when you have a B-cell target, it seems to induce tolerance to itself. It's a really incredible that I would not have predicted, and I think in the human immune system, it needs B-cells to, you know, to get this priming to happen. I don't think the dendritic cell does it. I mean, it's, that's, that's where our data is. It's, it's, um, so we have positive control. We give mouse antibody, just like you said, and then you get huge high titers of HAMA, and the cars get rejected um, if it's not targeting uh, a B cell. And when we target CD19 or CD22, the cars hang around, even though it's murine. So thank you. Thank you so much, Carl. Thanks.